Hey everyone, Reverend Dr. Katie here. This is a really quick video to answer some broad-based questions um, that I get a lot from many of you about what translation of the Bible might be really helpful for you. Um, many of you grew up with the King James or the New King James Version, and you know it's maybe a little outdated, but not quite sure why. So I'm gonna go over very quickly here kind of constructions and options of uh, Bible and Bible translations. Um, if you have any questions, put them in the comments. I'll be sure to respond. There's so many translations. I'm not going to cover them all. I'm just going to cover a few and uh, let you do your own homework uh, as far as this goes. So what is up with the King James Bible or the New King James Bible? And what's different about that compared to other ones? Um, the King James Bible was published in the 17th century in the early 1600s. It was commissioned by King James I of England because the England had undergone the uh, English Protestant Reformation in the century uh, preceding that or a little bit less 80 years or so and one of the results of the reformation was that people began reading scripture in their own vernacular language and so they um commissioned an English translation to be produced. So this translation is a very fine Elizabethan English translation of the Bible. But how do they do that? This is where um, I think a little bit of knowledge will go a long, long way for all of you. So when we do translations of the Bible, any translation you have, uh, any good translation that you have, should look at the original Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic text. And we do our translations directly from those texts. So one misconception that I hear quite a lot is that it's been translated so many different times that a lot has gotten lost in the translation. That's actually not true. We translate directly from the ancient text and produce new translations. The academic scholarly translation that I recommend, it's very readable, is the New Revised Standard Version. It was translated in 1989 directly from Greek, Hebrew, and Aramaic, Aramaic ancient text, right? So when when we say it's been translated so many times, it's been rewritten so many times, that's actually not quite the case. But the where we get the text, the ancient manuscripts from which we translate is really important. That's what I want to talk about. I promise we are going to circle right back around to the King James Version. We don't have any what we call autographs of the original scriptures. So whoever wrote down Genesis in the form that we have it today, we don't have that original copy in Hebrew. Whoever wrote the Gospel of Mark, which by the way, probably wasn't Mark, but whoever wrote that, we don't have the original copy and it's not signed by anyone. It doesn't say dated, dated such and such, you know, year in the first century uh, produced by Mark or, or anything like that. What we have are copies and copies and copies of the originals, but we have no originals. So there's no such thing as like the original Bible put together somewhere. What we have are critical editions that are collated from many, many texts. This happens not only with scripture, this happens for instance with Shakespeare. With Shakespeare, we have several variant versions of, of his plays and scholars put them all side by side, go through them, and then make an addition of which ones they think, uh, what they think the original words most likely were. Your English Bibles do the same thing. So for instance, of the New Testament uh, manuscripts that we have, we have five over 5,000 that are ancient. They range in size from like the size of a postage stamp or your hand, all the way to almost complete 27 books, or maybe some will have like a portion of the Gospel of Mark and a portion of one of Paul's letters. So we have 5,000 of these of varied quality, of varied length, and of varied um, kind of authenticity is, is how I'll put it. And what we do is we put all of them kind of side by side in a, a creative kind of way. And then we go through letter by letter, word by word, line by line, and we say, well, this one has, you know, the word the, the in English. This one's missing the word the in English. And we kind of um, measure which one is most likely to have been original. And there's a whole way that this happens. It's all, there's a whole kind of art and science to it. So if you open your Bibles to Mark 1.1, 1, 1, I'm going to do that right here. I'm going to show you an example. All right, so in my edition of the Bible, and any Bible that you have is an edition, the very first verse in the Gospel of Mark says, the beginning of the good news of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. 
But then I notice that there's a little footnote beside uh, the word God at the very end, beside the Son of God. I go down to my footnote at the bottom of my English Bible, and it says, other ancient authorities lack the Son of God. So this tells me that in some manuscripts, the words the Son of God was included, and in some manuscripts it's not. The editors of this Bible thought that there was reasonable evidence that it probably was in the original, so they included it here. But there's enough manuscripts that don't have those words that they gave that information to me in a footnote. So a good Bible you have will tell you in footnotes, uh, like the other ancient manuscripts add this or other ancient manuscripts don't add this, when it, especially when it really makes a theological difference. Now, most of the things that don't agree are very minor. Like it'll it'll usually be like a definite article or not a definite article or this one was plural or this one was singular. Occasionally there'll be something where it really makes a big difference and those are the kind of things we make a fuss about. So we have these 5,000 manuscripts. Um, digitalizing them has made it a lot easier to come up with, um, to kind of compare them side by side. And of course in the 1700s, they didn't have these digital editions. So when the King James Bible was commissioned, the scholars who put this, it's a critical edition, who put the critical edition together, consulted seven manuscripts. So they consulted seven really important manuscripts that are very ancient and well attested. But they didn't have access to all 5,000. They were also in a little bit of a rush. Um, so they, it was a little bit of a rush job because they really wanted to produce this quickly. Um, so they only consulted seven. Since then, well, there were more in existence at the time, but they didn't consult all of them. But since then, we've been able to expand our searches and expand the technology that helps us put together our editions of the Bible today. And so which one would you rather have? Would you rather have access to only seven manuscripts or all 5,000 where you can put, to, put them all side by side and make the best educated edition of scripture that's possible? So when the King James is kind of insisted upon, I think we're not using our the full arsenal, we're not using all of the full information that is available to us. So that's why I recommend not that you discard the King James if it's something that you love and is really meaningful and important to you, keep it, Just keep it side by side. There's some, some parts of the translations that are actually very, very good. And then compare it to other more contemporary translations that use the full range of all that we have available. So the New Revised Standard Version is one that I really like. Other ones that are, um, I'll make a list for you of other ones that I think are good translations. What you wanna stay away from, in my opinion, um, in general, are Bibles that are paraphrases. Because when it's a paraphrase, they're sometimes not consulting the original language. Sometimes the paraphrase Bibles are doing just that. They're paraphrasing from other um, translations, but not from the original texts. So that's something just to keep an eye out for uh, as you're making your own selections about what works well for you. There's tons of websites that you can go to that will compare multiple versions at once and put them out like side by side in a parallel version. Um, you can go to BibleGateway.com. Um, I've just lost all the other ones that might be possible. But anyway, there's a ton of sites out there. So you can Google that and find that out yourself too. And I see one or two questions. So let me uh, let me come over here and answer these. Okay, so where did they come from? So where did the manuscripts come from? Let me answer that. So we have an original that's lost. We don't have the originals anymore. And so what happened was... Um, communities in the in the early Christian communities, communities, for instance, would get a letter from Paul, um, and then they would want to share in the generations that followed as these became more important, they would want to share what Paul wrote to their community with their neighboring communities. So they would literally make a copy, and then someone would deliver that copy to that community, then that co that community would make a copy and they would deliver it elsewhere. So back in the ancient world, I mean, really, until the printing press, um, everything was hand copied. Eventually, scribes in, um, in monasteries were the copyist, and they would hand, hand copy manuscripts um, word for word. They had a lot of checks in place to make sure they didn't make errors, but they were human, and so sometimes they did make errors. Sometimes, scribes would be working from two or three copies at once and making their own, like for their own monastery, and the copies would conflict. And so the scribe would put in the margin, this one says this, this one says this, this is my best guess. So we can actually sometimes see the train of thought and how these manuscripts are coming together. Um, so that's where they come from and it gets much more complicated than that. Um, we have a lot of manuscripts from very dry places that preserve them well, like Egypt. Um, and so they tended to survive a little longer there. 
And so that's a brief history of how the New Testament is put together. Um, every, every Bible you have, Old Testament, New Testament, everything is an addition. It's not, we're not just taking it from one manuscript and putting it down on paper. We're collecting the best of the best of the best from all over the, the world and putting that together and what we think is the best translation. And then um, uh, again, a good Bible will give you footnotes to indicate where there might be discrepancies. So when we say the Bible, it's hard to even know exactly what we mean because there's not just one Bible. There's a full range of potential of this thing that we now call the Bible. I find that very comforting, very illuminating because God is so big and God gives us kind of the best of the best. We have this diversity um, even within our scriptures and how they come together. Uh, and I personally love that and love that about our faith tradition. All right, y'all, I'm going to keep this. I'm going to go ahead and uh, close this one out. If you have, if you have any other questions, uh, put them in the comments, make sure you tag me and I will see that and respond pretty soon. All right. Talk to you soon.